I spoke last week on Hebrews 3, the, the positive confession. Now if you'll turn to Hebrews 4, I want to deal with uh, a couple of verses there. Subject tonight is mixing in faith. Perhaps we better start reading back in chapter 3, verse 7, and pick up the context of Hebrews 3, 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart. And they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now that's the key idea. He's not recording history for history's sake, but he's saying to us, Take heed, lest God says to us in his wrath, You'll not enter into my rest. Why? Because of doubt and fear and unbelief about his word. And then down in, in uh, verse 17, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that it, they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? That's the ones that couldn't enter in, the ones that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. It was impossible. Now, he didn't write in chapters, and his purpose is to bring it to us. Let us, therefore, fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, you see, and them that heard it. So that's what we're going to speak about tonight, mixing in faith what you hear, mixing faith in what you hear. You can sit and hear and hear and hear and never enter into God's rest unless you mix faith in what you hear. Paul tells us over in Romans ten seventeen that faith cometh by hearing the word, but just hearing the word will not produce anything in you unless you respond as you hear. I mean, like sitting there tonight. Make some faith in what you hear. Paul says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 2 and verse 16 that the gospel he preached produced life in those who heard it if they mixed faith with it, believed it. But he said the same word produced death in those who heard the gospel of life if they didn't mix any faith with it. The same gospel you preach, he says, who, who are, who's sufficient for these things? The same word that we speak to a person about the baptism, if they believe it, they're empowered of God. If not, they're cutting themselves off from the source of power and might. And the same with the gospel of salvation or healing or anything else. The same word that we minister here tonight can either bless you or it will, it will bind or condemn you because the gospel produces that effect. That's the word of God. That you can hear a word and still not participate in it if you don't mix faith in it. In fact, it would be worse for you having heard it. Yes, it's much worse for you having heard it if you don't mix faith in what you hear. You see, Israel, as Paul is telling us here, heard the word day after day from God through Moses that could have saved them and delivered them and brought them into their inheritance and they would have rested from their enemies and their labors and their slavery and their bondage and all of that. But because it did not mix any faith with what they heard day to day, then they perished just like the nations round about who had never heard the word. It's all the same as if they, they'd never heard it. They were not, uh, they were not, uh, did not receive any better privilege for having heard. They were worse off for having heard. They're still cursed to this day. Their blessings are coming, but I'll tell you, they're not here yet. If anyone has ever uh, read any history at all, you're worse off for having heard. And so they perished just like the people who never heard the word, never had the revelation because he didn't mix any faith in it. He said, let us therefore fear, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into God's rest that any of you should seem to come short of it. Why? Because you don't mix faith with what you hear. 
Uh, you see, when you're mixing up a cake, uh, you can put all the ingredients there, but if you want a cake that rises and not a pancake, you've got to mix some life in the cake, which women know and some men know as baking powder. Baking powder is the life of the cake. Well, faith is the life of the word you're hearing tonight. It just doesn't automatically bless you. You've got to mix some faith with it as you hear it. You've got to believe it. You've got to respond to it. You've got to act upon it. He says, let us fear lest the same thing happen to us as happened to Israel. Faith is the way you enter into God's rest. Now, what is his rest? Well, it's a whole lot of things. But one thing that his rest is, is that it is all of the promises that he's given us. You see, you're not resting when you're sick all the time. You're not resting when you're poverty stricken. You're not resting when you're depressed and defeated and trials and problems uh, overwhelm you and, and get you down. The promises of salvation and the Holy Spirit and healing and health and protection and deliverance and the meeting of your needs and so on. These, uh, well, and the promises that enable us by faith to fulfill the commission and get people saved and the job done. This is God's rest because a person who doesn't believe like Mark 16 can't rest in Jesus. He will, he will work to get the job done. And, and, uh, and the ministry is a rest. Salvation's a rest. And the baptism's the way you enter into that rest. Uh, uh, Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12 tell us the baptism's a rest. I see some people with it really still working about as hard as they ever did, trying to get people saved and get the job done. And, but the baptism's a rest. We have to learn that God hasn't called us to work for Him, but to learn to move with Him. That's what the Holy Spirit's for. And so the promises are a rest, but if you don't mix faith with these promises that you hear week to week as it comes over this desk or wherever you're hearing anointed teaching, if you don't mix faith with it, it's all the same as not having heard it. It won't profit you a thing. You see, Israel made the same made that mistake, and God doesn't want us to make the same mistake. She thought because she came out of Egypt, she was now free of slavery, oppression, and bondage. She hoped and really thought she was going to enter into a rest and enter into her inheritance in the promised land. But because she didn't mix any faith day to day as she heard Moses speak and give this revelation from God, then she never was able to throw off her chains. And she was as much in slavery and the freedom of the wilderness as she was when she was back in bondage in Egypt. And so, dear friend, there's no point in you sitting out there complacently or any of us being complacent about this thing and running around saying, I'm a child of the king and singing like that and I'm a joint heir with Christ and I've got this and I've got that. If you're not mixing faith in what you're hearing and what you're reading in the Word, you remain in bondage just like Israel, even though you're in the church and uh, maybe on your way to heaven. You can, the, the churches are filled with people who are bound to sickness, disease, poverty, depression. Well, you name it, they've got it, from failure to fear. And these are, these are forms of bondage, you see, that they think they're free, but they're not free because they're not mixing faith in all of these thousands of great, exceeding great and precious promises that God has given us. So there's no point in us saying, I'm a joint heir with Christ, we're joint heirs with Christ, and that we're free if we're not free, and we're not free if we don't mix faith with His Word and believe it and act upon it and respond to it. As I've said before, that, that Israel, as we're told in the book of Numbers, was blessed and couldn't be cursed because the old prophet Balaam tried several times to curse Israel on behalf of the king of Moab, and every time he'd open his mouth, a blessing would come out. And so he just finally gave up in Numbers 23, 19, and 20, and he says, I can't curse them. He says, they're blessed, and he says, I can't reverse it. God has blessed them, and I, I have to speak blessing. And Israel wouldn't believe she was blessed, and she wouldn't believe what the heathen prophet said about her, even. He knew she was blessed, and she insisted on being cursed, and so God said, I'll give her what she wants. And so he did. He said, they're confessing they're going to fall, their carcasses will fall in the wilderness. He said, everyone above the age of 20 will die in the wilderness except Caleb and Joshua. You know, only two men entered the promised land out of the three million at least that left Egypt. Only two men, Caleb and Joshua. Because they're the only two that mix faith in what they heard Moses say. So are you mixing any faith in these promises you hear week to week? I mean, you answer that for yourself. There are two things that I believe that will characterize those of us who obey Hebrews 4, 1 and 2 and begin to mix faith with what we hear and what we read from the Word of God. 
The first thing that I think that will characterize us, that I know will characterize us, is that we will not just be hearers of the word, we'll be doers. Amen. Amen. Paul said here that Israel heard the word, but were not doers of the word. Over in James chapter 1 and verse 22, James tells us, admonishes us, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. He said, deceiving your own selves. Do you know you can deceive yourself by coming to hear and not do? I think one of the greatest deceptions that is plaguing the Christian church is that there are just multitudes of people who think they have something. They think they are partakers of something they really don't have simply because they're hearing it or simply because they belong to a church that teaches it or believes it or simply because they are regular participants in a charismatic work like this where we believe in healing and believe in prosperity. They somehow think they've got it and they're going to have it and they're going to partake of it just because they're, they're present and hearing the word. And you can hear it and hear it and hear it and still not partake of it unless you mix faith with it as you hear it. Do you realize there are people, charismatic Christians, who die every week of disease and sickness and they accept the truth of divine healing, believe it and will teach it and talk about it, and yet they're dying of sickness and disease themselves? It's not because they don't accept the truth of healing. It's because they don't mix faith with what they hear uh, concerning divine healing. I mean, uh, you've got to mix faith as you hear it week to week, day to day, Amen. as you read it and hear it. Because when that trial comes, when that real test comes, if it's a heart attack, if it's cancer, if it's something serious, if it's a loved one, a baby that's seriously ill or injured, if it's a broken arm or you name it, tumor, cancer, and you haven't been mixing faith in this word, you, as you hear it and as you read it day to day, you're going to struggle around to try to find some faith. You may think you have it, but you'll find it's not there. You've got to mix faith in as you hear. And uh, as one pastor told me, he said, we teach divine healing in our church, but they certainly, most of them don't mix faith with what they hear because he said, half the time, when they're seriously ill, they'll call me to come and anoint them and pray for them. He says, uh, many times as I go out after having prayed for them, I meet the doctor coming in. And he said, I just tell them that if you're not going to mix faith or believe God, uh, if you're not going to trust God for your healing, he says, don't call me. I mean, after all, that's logical. Uh, all a, all a, a Christian can do, whether he's a pastor or one of you, all a Christian can do when a person calls uh, for prayer, for healing, is pray for them. There's nothing else you can do but call on God. You can't heal them, and all you can do is believe God. If you're not going to believe God, why waste the preacher's time? I mean, please don't waste my time. I've got a whole lot to do, friends. I've got a whole lot more to do than to run around praying for people who are not going to believe in the prayers that we pray. And so he said, if you're not going to believe God, don't call me. Praise God for a pastor who tells it like it is. You don't find money like that today. And he was Pentecostal, too. And so he said, at least give God time to work, like two or three days, you know, before you push the panic button and say, it didn't work and I better go back on the pills or call the doctor. Give God a chance. Amen. Hello. Is that too much to ask? Three whole days? Three whole days? I don't think it's too much to ask. I mean, not all who are hearers or doers, they heard him. They're in Pentecost. They've been in for years, but they weren't doers. They weren't, they weren't mixing faith in it. You can't get that faith when it's serious overnight. Faith comes by hearing the word. If it's not just hearing about it when you have a bad need, you know. Although sometimes we know there are exceptions to any rule. We see miracles happen. Uh, but that is the exception and not the rule. We see miracles happen when a person's just heard a little bit of the word. Uh, but that's something else. It doesn't prove anything at all. It just proves that God can do it his way anytime he wants. And I'm all for that. But... Not all who are hearers are doers. I've preached this word of faith to thousands of people. Some have heard it many times. And not all who've heard it have been doers of what they've heard. And I'll tell you why. Because word gets back to me. And it's happened more than once that some who heard the word of faith many times in time of emergency and a real trial will depend on the arm of the flesh. They'll run to the doctor, go back to their pills, or submit to surgery in a hospital. Now, why did they do that in time of trial? It's because they weren't mixing faith week after week in what they were hearing. Uh, from this word that we were giving them. Now, not all were like that. Most were not. 
they come to the place where they can stand in time of uh, need and trial. But you've got to mix some faith as you hear it. Because James says, if, if you do not mix faith in what you hear, it's all the same as not having heard it. He says it'll profit you nothing. James 1.22. It'll just profit you nothing. You can hear and hear and hear. And then when you have a need, it'll profit you nothing. But we can turn this thing around. A lot of times people can't be doers of the Word because they're not hearing enough of the Word to do. I mean, you've got to... You've got to hear enough of the Word to know what to do to be a doer and not just a hearer. But if, if you're going to know what to do, you've got to hear enough to know what to do. And some people are just not regular enough when God sets ministry in their midst. Or they're not interested enough to get out or to get into the Word to find out what they're supposed to do. You'd be surprised how many charismatics. I think I've mentioned this before a few dozen times. How many charismatics? Uh, have stopped with the baptism. And if they hear one message on faith or one message on deliverance or one message on the deeper life, they think that's all there is on that topic. Let's now go on to something else. When I was speaking in Louisiana several months ago, uh, the second night of the meeting, a brother came to me and said, well, we're going back to Dallas tomorrow. He said, I heard you last year when you were in Texas on faith. I was there for two nights, spoke two messages. So that's all he could have heard, two messages. He said, I thought this year, over here in Louisiana, you were going to speak on the deeper life because you already preached on faith down this area, you know. <laughs> now, he said, I know these people here in Louisiana need to hear this message of faith, but I already heard it. I was hoping you were going to speak on the deeper life. He says, we're going back. We're not going to stay any longer this week. And he says, I know they need to hear it, but he said, you know, we, we've heard you on faith. <laughs> he heard two messages. And so I thought to myself, my, he sure must have a lot of faith. He must have a lot of faith. Uh, must really be strong in the faith. He's heard two messages and he doesn't need any more. And he said, yes, we're going back tomorrow. He says, oh, by the way, he said, uh, before, before I leave tonight, he said, would you pray for this cough? He said, I've got a cough. I just can't get the victory over it. I've prayed and prayed and prayed. He says, I can't get the victory. Will you pray for it? I mean, here's a fellow who's got all the faith he's needed. He's heard two whole sermons on faith. And he doesn't have faith enough to deliver himself from a common cold or a simple headache without special prayer. Some people think that they've heard one message, that that's all there is in that topic. Why, friends, we've been preaching faith here for about seven years, you know. And the well isn't, haven't reached bottom yet. Don't anticipate it. You just, faith comes by hearing the word. Faith doesn't come by hearing it once. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. If you want that cake to rise, you've got to mix enough baking powder in it, life in it, to get it up there. You can have a pancake with a little baking powder, but if you want a cake, you've got to put something in it enough. And so it is with faith. If you want your faith to rise, to mature, you've got to hear that word and hear that word and hear that word. Like the woman out in Virginia who was miraculously healed of cancer, literally eaten up with cancer. We have the letter, as we do in many of these things, I tell you, in our files, uh, where they've written us and told us about the miracle. This is a case where even when you go into other states, they stop you and tell you about the miracle uh, of this woman because it was a tremendous thing. Now, this woman said she was healed by listening to one of our tapes, a faith message. Someone gave it to her, knew that she was hopelessly ill. The doctors told her there's just absolutely nothing that they could do and just had a short time to live. Gave her one of the tapes. Now, she didn't listen to that message once or twice, as some people do occasionally. Uh, I got a letter recently where somebody said we listened to a certain tape twice. Listened to a certain tape twice. And they thought that was a big thing, you know, to hear the same sermon twice. Well, friends, some of these I've heard hundreds of times. <laughs> I mean, tell you, my faith just keeps growing, and they're my sermons, and I'm hearing me. Because <laughs> faith comes by hearing the Word. Amen. 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 Now, if you, if you can't handle that, that's your problem. But that's just the way it is. Faith comes by hearing the Word. I'm going to have faith, but that's going to stop, too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, it doesn't bother me, but I don't want you to be uh, turned on. <laughs> she didn't listen to it twice like some do. She didn't listen to it three or four times like a rare individual will tell you. I've heard that tape three or four times, and it really helped me. She didn't listen to it five or six times as a very exceptional person occasionally might do. 
She didn't listen to it eight or nine or ten times. She didn't listen to it twenty times. She didn't listen to it thirty times. She didn't listen to it forty times or fifty times or sixty times or seventy times or eighty times. She said, I listened one hundred times to that tape on faith and it just drove the cancer out of my body. It couldn't stop. Totally healed. She wasn't healed on the ninety-ninth time. She heard it until the word of faith drove it out. Amen. Cancer cannot live around the word of faith. Amen. The devil cannot stand the presence of a strong, bold confession of faith, as we told you last week. And that's why, that's why they rise up in my meetings a lot of times and tell you to shut up. And, and you can't say that. And, and you'll, I never had that problem preaching old dead dry Baptist stuff. You might put a few people to sleep, but. Uh, I never had any interruptions. I mean, I've had all kinds of interruptions. Everything from epileptic seizure to up or down, you name it. And people who have those can't help it. It's the spirit in them has to get out. They can't stand that bold word of faith. And the only way they can get them out is to give them a seizure so they think you'll carry them out. But I'll tell you, in the three times it's happened in my meetings, the devil got a black eye. They got delivered. One man got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and delivered of an epileptic spirit. The devil thought he was going to tear up the meeting, and God got the glory through it. But, but she listened to it a hundred times. Would you listen to a tape a hundred times? We get letters all the time where they say we wear these tapes out. And about the time you just can't hear them anymore, the healing comes. Wear them out. We're talking about... We're talking about... Doing more than just what the average person may do. We said you've got to be a doer of what you hear, but some people don't hear enough to do. They don't know what to do because they'll hear a message once. They'll read the faith book once. You don't get faith by reading that once. Like the man in Florida said, he said, I just can't get this healing and I I don't know what's wrong. Can you tell me? Well, I could have told him his confession was bad, but... uh, uh, really, uh, a better approach a lot of times is to say what you need is instruction. There are no exceptions to God's promises to heal or to do anything else he said he would do, but there are conditions. So all you need is instruction. I said, get the faith book. We were leaving. I said, get in that. There are all the principles and conditions for healing or for receiving the promises of God. Oh, he said, I read that. Didn't work. <laughs> well... Sometimes I get inspired righteously <laughs> with indignation. <laughs> no, I just sometimes you just get fired up and it's the Holy Spirit talking. He said, oh, I've read that and it didn't work. I said, brother, I'm not talking about reading that. I'm not talking about reading that. I'm talking about studying that. I'm talking about digesting that. I'm talking about doing what it says and you can't help but get healed. <laughs> I'll guarantee you, you cannot help but get healed because that will point you to the Word. And hundreds and hundreds have been healed. And many of them write us or tell us as we're out traveling about the United States and Canada. Right in that page, right there is where I got my healing of this tremendous thing. Or off of a tape. A woman in Minnesota said, let me tell you, we listened to your messages from last year up here. We weren't at the convention. We got them from somebody, and we listened to those series of tapes on faith and healing for three weeks, just over and over and over. She said, I was cured of chronic asthma, totally healed, and my husband of multiple sclerosis, incurable disease. Those are things you don't imagine. You're either well or you're not. (laughs) It's not like a little headache uh, that can go and come, but uh, some people show you the books. They're dog-eared and worn out, marked up, scriptures on them. We're not talking about reading it. Don't bother to read our literature. I mean, I spend more time than that writing it than just perusing through it once and saying, well, oh, well, it didn't work or it didn't help. We're talking about if if you come to hear this message vocally, the same spirit that inspired what you're hearing tonight inspired everything there. And so if you're going to take the trouble to drive out to hear it, well, when you get that home, take the trouble to do more than read it once. Study it. Memorize it. I, I mean, uh, that isn't boasting. It's just if it, if it isn't helping people, we wouldn't be sending it out by the hundreds of thousands of copies. And who's Hobart Freeman? You know, it's not like somebody that everybody's heard about for 20 years, like Oral Roberts. And yet we, we can go in a, in a four-day CFO meeting and a thousand dollars worth of that literature will go out in just four days. Uh, 
a tremendous, a Baptist church with about, you couldn't crowd over 300 people into $1,150 worth of literature. I'm just telling you that to say that, that people don't buy things that don't work. And they buy one copy of that and come back and buy a dozen copies. My wife takes care of the books and she goes carrying literature in. You know, she'll carry a package of faith books, 25. Oh, what are you going to do with all those? All those? Why, there are going to be hundreds of those sold here. And so we're just telling you that it's God. We're not taking any credit for it. That if we wouldn't be pointing you to literature if it didn't work. Uh, these people say, oh, I don't want to read somebody's literature. I want to read the Word. Well, the same fellow that's preaching to you what he believes about the Word, put it right in print. What's the difference? I mean, whether you read it printed or spoken. I mean, it's a little ridiculous for us to get so pious that we can't follow anybody but Jesus, you know. And, and Paul said that's just all wet. He said, one of you follows Peter, another follows Apollos, and another says, I'm following Paul, and another group says, I'm not going to follow anybody but Jesus. He says, you're all all wrong because all of us belong to you. He said, just claim us all. Claim Paul, Apollos, C, Hobart, everybody. <laughs> Whatever you can use, whatever helps you claim it, it's Amen. yours. I claim you. Amen. I wouldn't be here if you weren't. I just Amen. claim you'll be here. Amen. I'm not going to claim three or four people. Amen. You belong to me, you see, and I belong to you. Amen. And so get, get delivered of that business. I'm just going to follow Jesus. People who say that are not following Jesus. No, they're not because you just don't know the word. He set fivefold ministers in the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to bring the body to perfection, you see. God works through men, all imperfect vessels, but we're all earthen vessels. But that's the way he's ordained it, friends. And whenever, whenever we get so pious and holy and spiritual that we can't listen to men and we don't need elders and leadership, well, we've gotten so spiritual that we're not even hearing from God. Because that, that isn't Bible. And let's stay with the Word. Do like that woman who said, uh, I said the other night, I said, after she made a confession about, she asked me a question about healing for herself. I said, well, uh, whatever I told her. And then she said, well, don't you worry. She said, I've got my healing. It just isn't manifested yet, but I know I've got it. Well, I said, boy, that's a good confession anyway. I said, you sure know how to confess that you're healed even though you don't feel healed yet. That's Mark eleven twenty four. Well, she said, I ought to make a good confession. She said, I read your book positive thinking and positive confession oh she said I'll take that back I didn't read your book she said I've studied it I've cracked and memorized it well she ought to make a good confession because that's the word if you don't think it's the word you better stay out of it because you'll find it is the word it's filled with scripture that will show you that most Christians are defeating themselves by what they say what they think and what they say so man thinketh in his heart so is he God is looking for people who will mix faith with what they heard. They had to hear it from Moses. God didn't come down and talk to Israel. So they came through a man. And they wouldn't mix faith with what Moses said. So he's looking for people who will believe more of the word than just to get delivered out of Egypt saved. And just to get a little power to praise with the baptism. And then don't want to mix faith with any of the other things that the ministers that God has anointed in this hour are saying and teaching that they ought to be believing and ought to be doing and don't want to go on into their rest and claim their inheritance. You know something? It may not make somebody feel so good to say it, but God isn't interested because you're here tonight hearing. He couldn't care less. Amen. If you're not here to mix faith with what you hear. He does not want to fill the chairs of this church with hearers of the word who are not doers. Amen. Oh, friends, you won't even be happy around here for two or three weeks in a row. You couldn't last three weeks in, a, in this ministry if you don't want to do. Because we just, we just, with the Word, get you in a corner of the place that, that you're so miserable you want to get out or you want to get with it. So one of the two things have to happen. That's God's Word. He said, be ye doers and not hearers because you're deceiving yourself. To hear and not to do. Do like this surgeon's life in Georgia. <clears throat> several months ago, who sat all week hearing this and said, she and her husband, charismatic, said, we never heard anything like this message of faith and, and the way you present healing and all of that. And they were just eating it up. And then the last night of the meeting, we ministered to them, uh, to the people there in this, uh, it's called the Straight Gate. It's, uh, it's a work there, kind of like the barn, you know. It's not a church. It was just a work where uh, they would call in speakers and have ministry. 
And uh, at the close of the meeting, I minister this. Uh, my general practice is now not to minister every night, but at the close of the meeting when faith has gotten high. And we're praying for the various needs. And here she came, the surgeon's wife, and the Spirit of God said to me, Tell her to speak whatever she desires, and I'll give it to her. Mark eleven twenty three. I've been preaching it all week. But you know, you can hear it all week if you're not mixing faith with it. It won't work. I said, the Lord says, whatever you speak will come to pass. Well, she stopped and hesitated for a moment, and then she came through with it, and she claimed a tremendous thing. She said, I claim the deliverance of my friend who is, has lost her mind in a mental institution. I mean, a big thing, you know. And uh, we got a letter when we got back. She said, you know, when you said to me you were praying for all the others, and I thought you were going to pray for me or agree with me for her deliverance, the friend's deliverance. But she said, as I came up to you, you just said, speak whatever you want, what you desire, in faith, and God will give it to you. And she said, I was at first shocked and a bit embarrassed before all those people because I thought you were going to do the talk. And she said, then I saw we had her. That's the way she put it. I saw we had it. And she said, I just spoke it out in faith, commanded it in Jesus' name. And she said, in three days, she said, three days, totally delivered from that spirit of insanity. And she's free from the mental institution. Just a matter of three days. Now, what I'm saying is this. She had been hearing the word all week that would do that. But if she had not been mixing faith with it night after night, you see, that came as a surprise to her. She couldn't have found any faith to have spoken that in faith. I didn't deliver the woman. Nobody delivered her but herself. She spoke that word of faith. She had to have faith, and she had to have it when a trial came or an emergency or or at an abrupt moment like that. You can't get faith in a moment to speak faith that will deliver somebody off somewhere in an institution, have them set free in three days. If you're not mixing faith night after night, day after day, and what you hear, you're just not going to be able to get a hold of it. She said, I was really shocked that, that I had to do something. She said, all of a sudden I saw I had it. She had been mixing faith with it, you see. And she turned it loose. Are you mixing faith with the promises you hear week after week in this church? James says, if you're not, then it's all the same as not having heard because it will profit you nothing. Did you know that you can be a rich man? That is, you can have a relative who dies and leaves you a fortune, but you, you'll still be in poverty if you don't hear about it. You've got to hear it. Now, you're hearing tonight. You see, you've got to hear it, but you'll still be in poverty if you don't mix some faith with the report that you hear and rise up and respond to it and go down and claim it. What belongs to you, your inheritance. Thomas heard the report that Jesus was alive, but he didn't mix any faith with what he heard. He said, seeing is believing. I'll not believe till I see. And Jesus came along the next week and he said, now you believe because I've chosen you to believe. That's the only reason Thomas made it in. He said, you believe because you've seen me. But he said, blessed are those who mix faith with the report they hear about me and don't have to see to believe. He said, blessed are those who say believing is seeing, not seeing is believing. When you believe, you'll see. Amen. When you believe what you're hearing tonight, you'll see the results. You'll see it in your life. Are you mixing some faith with what you've been hearing tonight and these weeks past? You've been hearing... From this pulpit, not just me, but I'm suppo- I suppose just about everybody in the church acts like they believe that you've been hearing that we're joint heirs with Christ, that you've got an inheritance. Have you been believing these things and mixing faith with it and claiming your inheritance and walking in victory and overcoming in all things? You having any trouble with it, you say? Well, praise God. Take your skepticals off and look at the Word. <laughs> Take your bifocals off and get into some by faith. I'll claim it. You do something. I mean, the church is filled. I'm talking about charismatics who ought to know better with Christians who are no better off than Israel because they're not mixing faith with what God has said in His Word. These plain promises of healing and prosperity and health and victory and your family being saved if you claim them. Well, we've got a woman right here that gave a testimony this morning how they claimed this young man. And his brother stood in Wednesday, stood in Sunday and he gets saved Wednesday. That's pretty quick work. It doesn't have to be that soon. Because they believe the promise and, and they refuse to look at the circumstances, the fact that he's getting worse and uh, everything to discourage 
uh, them would be evident. But they refused to look at that and held on to their faith. And this is just one incident of we could multiply it over and over and over where people are claiming their loved ones by faith because they've taken their skepticals off and they're looking at these promises through new eyes now that they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they're seeing that there are things there they never saw before. That you don't have to have everything spelled out to see a loved one say. There's no word in John 14, 14 about Isabel Freeman. But that's... The name I put there one night when he said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And I saw her saved in ten minutes. Amen. Ten minutes after she heard the word. And I prayed for her for 14 years. Praying for 14 years, friend, is not faith. Not when you have a promise. The church is no better off than Israel. Charismatics, most of them are no better off than Israel. They give testimonies to how they got healed in the hospital. Charismatics who say they believe in divine healing. Like one Pentecostal pastor's wife said, wife, this is the first sermon I've heard in 30 years that teaches divine healing the way I believe it. Now that's what she said. That isn't me boasting. That's just what she said. This is the first time in 30 years. She said, you know where we get healed anymore in our Pentecostal churches? We come on Wednesday after we get out of the hospital and praise God for healing us on the operating table, healing us on this miracle drug and that sort of thing. She says it's pathetic. She had a husband just getting ready, pastor, to go to the hospital for ulcers, and there I was preaching on healing. <clears throat> oh, I said, yeah. He said, I know that healing's true, but he said, I've already made my point. <laughs> he didn't bother to ask me to pray for him. He said, oh, he said, uh, he said, I, I've already made it. And he said, uh, they're expecting me Monday, so. <laughs> Pentecostals. Charismatic. They can speak in tongues just as fluently as you. I mean, the Christians, the charismatics I'm running into, friends, have no more rest than Israel got rest. There's no rest when you don't walk in total faith in all of the Word of God and all of the promises. It's a beautiful thing when you rest in Him and rest in this Word. And Jesus sets forth the principle in the Gospels time and again that's going to govern what you get in this life and even in the next life he says the principle that governs what you get and how much you get be it unto thee according to thy faith I'm going to preach on that some night when we need some faith teaching Uh, be it unto thee according to thy faith amen I mean if you send up a little that's all you're going to get if you're like Brother Smith who had desperate financial needs was going bankrupt and He really had never tried this financial thing, and he'd been taught like everyone else. You know, God's not interested in your temporal needs and prosperity and all of that. Uh, He was desperate. It was either God or failure because he couldn't borrow the money, so he sent up his request in prayer. The Father, Jesus heard it and took it to the Father, since he's our intercessor, and the Father says, Good, Brother Smith needs financial help. Well, let's answer that. What did he send his request up in? He said, A thimble. Well, he said, Fill it with funds and send it back. (laughs) <laughs> be it unto thee according to thy faith Amen. I don't know about you I thought that was pretty good I don't know about <laughs> or I think maybe the reason the reason that it was so quiet is maybe that's what you've been sending your requests up in <laughs> but I'll tell you dear friend I don't know about you but I always send mine up in a gallon bucket <laughs> Amen no leaks you're not going to lose a thing you're going to get, it's going to be according to your faith most of you out there if you'll be honest have a poverty complex and you picked it up at church you didn't pick it up at school or anywhere else you got it at church as one sister told me who I ministered with their outreach for a while for about a year she said praise God for the message of faith she said you know I got saved by a miracle Jesus appeared to her in college university miracle she didn't even know anything about the Bible went around for three days telling people about Jesus Uh, He appeared to her and saved her and put her out in ministry. She has a healing ministry. And she asked if we'd minister with them, and we did for about a year. And she said, praise God for this faith message. She said, do you know what? She said, we have to finance our work by faith, you know, thousands of dollars at a time. And she said, I launched out with faith, but she said, I found out I didn't have the faith to get the funds. And she said, you know what? I discovered that when I got saved, I went and joined the church 
and they were teaching me to expect the worst and to expect poverty and to always be in need and that's proof you're spiritual. She said, the first thing you know, I had developed a poverty complex and now I don't have the faith to believe for what I need to support this ministry until she heard the word of faith and got back in it. And if you're honest, I say, you will admit you've got a poverty complex. I mean, where is that brother? Is he still here? Did he disappear? Mel. All right, ask him what we told him about fixing up the barn. He's talking about thousands of dollars. We said, Mel, you just handle the work. You don't have to worry about the funds. God will supply it all. Now that's my confession to you. Amen. Church, church is going to give him a thousand dollar check just to just to put the emphasis to what we told him. Just to start out with, Amen. no collateral, no nothing. Does he look honest? I can't help it. He's going to get it anyway. You know what I mean? Uh, we just, if we believe the Lord's in it, He doesn't have to to come and report to us. I spends every nickel and dime. Now, you see, we make those statements around here. You can ask Brother Sponseller why he would sometimes try to give me the details on uh, what, where he'd spent the money around here. And I said, just give me the total. So we can write the check. We want to go home. <laughs> Friends, this is the kind of God we're talking about. You don't have to, you don't have to penny pinch with him. Amen. If it's his work, then just say, let's do the work. Yes, you're to use some wisdom, but get rid of that poverty spirit that binds most of you. God is not in the used car business. God is not in the used clothing business. God is not in the hamburger business. You see, all we know is that old line we've been taught by the churches. And I used to teach it, so we don't say it just to criticize what's being taught. We just know without the Holy Spirit you'll be blind, but we should not remain blind after we get the Holy Spirit. And as soon as you mention the fact that God wants to bless us materially and in a temporal way, and he says that in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And as soon as you get get to teaching the truth that, that Matthew 6 means what it says, you're to take no thought for material things and that he'll supply abundantly for you. As soon as you start teaching along this line, you always got people that, that start raising eyebrows. And uh, generally, I look at the ceiling and the walls when I'm teaching on financial prosperity. And you'll have people come after and want to debate it and say, God's not interested in anything but your What they think is, is, uh, is an unanswerable proof text. Jesus said to forsake all. Well, he did say to forsake all. But when he said to forsake all, he doesn't mean that you're to run around hungry and sick and poverty-stricken and filled with needs. Because if, if that's what he meant, it would contradict all of the other promises where he says he doesn't want you doing that. Amen. When he said, I want you to be in health, I want you to prosper, then how are you going to reconcile that with forsake all? He did say forsake all, but he must mean something besides what people try to tell us he means. And anyway, those people who say it don't believe it, don't even believe that themselves. They haven't forsaken all. I mean, I haven't seen a one of them naked and destitute who said Jesus said forsake all. They really don't believe that's what he meant. They mean he, they mean he meant something besides what they're trying to convince me he meant. And the only time they bring that up is when you're preaching on the fact God wants to bless you materially, physically, spiritually, mentally, every way. And his word is filled with such promises. And so he's not going to contradict all of his promises to bless you in these ways by having us come along and say forsake all means what they're trying to say it does. Forsake all means exactly what he intended to. You're to forsake all of your affection for anything of this world. You're not to lust after it. You're to care nothing for it. And then he says, I'll bless you abundantly. If you just forsake every affection, sometimes it means giving up material things. But he says, I'll return those to you and bless you. Uh, uh, now, we just need to have a little scripture on that. So some of us, some won't go to sleep on us or or start reading their commentaries to try to disprove it. Turn over to Mark chapter 10, and I want to deliver you forever from that old line that Jesus, when he said forsake all, meant you could never have any material prosperity in this life. 
If you, if you can't handle it, he isn't going to give it to you, of course. But I want to see you delivered forever from that old device of the devil to keep you poor and poverty stricken so you can't have any time for the kingdom's work because you've got to spend all your time trying to make ends meet. See, a person who walks in total faith for temporal needs never has to spend any time praying about temporal needs. We don't pray about temporal needs in this church. You don't have to. You walk in the faith of that. As one brother said, uh, ministered with him in Florida, he said, the Lord said, go to Africa. And I said, Lord, I don't have a penny. That takes $10,000. And the Lord said, well, I've got it all. Just go. <laughs> and he said, I never once prayed for the money. I just told the Lord what it took. He said, and he sent every penny in. You don't have to pray about what God sent you to do. Just tell him you believe it and start on your way. Buy the ticket. Get ready to go. Get the map out. Draw the line of the route. So look at verse 23 of Mark 10. You're going to get delivered tonight, and if you don't, you're hopeless, friends. <laughs> if the Word of God, if you call yourself a Christian, I mean if you claim to be, and the Word of God won't set you free, then, there, then there's no help. Yeah. He says it's impossible, very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 23. And verse 26, they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, well, who can be saved? If a rich man is very difficult... And Jesus said, with God it's possible even for a rich man to be saved. Now verses 28, 29, and 30. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all, and we followed thee. There's the forsake all. We forsook all. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man, that's you out there, friends, there is no man that has left house, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, material blessings, for my sake and the gospels, but that he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Amen. Houses and lands and husbands and wives and mothers and sisters with persecution and in the life to come, eternal life. He contrasts now with eternal life. He says, if you give it up, I give it back a hundredfold now in this life. And I want to tell you, you're looking at an example of him giving it back a hundredfold in this life and here and now. We don't wear hand-me-downs and eat hamburger and drive used cars and worry about how to pay the bills. We just forsake all, give up all affection for it, and he supplies abundantly. You see, it's the affection of your heart. You can give up everything you own and covet my car. You see, it's the spirit that he works at. <laughs> Maybe some more, some already have. Brother said the other, the other night when I said that, he said, Amen. <laughs> We've been looking at my car. <laughs> but... These people who say Jesus said forsake all, don't, they're just using that for an argument to try to, well, to destroy what their church doesn't teach, uh, the effectiveness of what you've said. They don't believe it. They're not poverty stricken. None of them are on relief. They're not on bread and water diets. They'd be too proud to wear hand-me-downs from Salvation Army or from Goodwill Industries. Uh, they don't believe in forsaking all. That's just an argument. They haven't forsaken all. If they'd forsaken all, they'd be wearing burlap and living in a cave and begging with a tin cup and pencils. And if they ever do that, if ever, I've never seen anyone that says forsake all that's done that. And if they ever do it, I'm going to tell him, brother, you don't have to live that kind of life because the Word's filled with promises that will get you out of that poverty complex. <laughs> that Jesus is not glorified by you running around with cold feet because you've got no shoes on your feet and naked and destitute and hungry and starving your family to death. That's a lack of death. That's a lack of faith. That's a lack of understanding Amen. His Word. He says, uh, he says, Beloved, I wish you above all things you prosper. Philippians 4.19, My God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. Amen. Amen. Matthew 6.33, Delight yourself in me. Psalm 37.4, I'll give you the desires of your heart, and on and on and on and on. Uh, these people don't believe this that say this. But we have a poverty complex. I was down in Florida some months ago and teaching on faith. And uh, 
I mentioned along the way, and sometimes I do, that uh, you can get to the place of such total trust in God, you don't need insurance. He's your assurance. And you take out Psalm 91, and that's what you need. That's all you need. And assurance is better than insurance. Insurance obviously can only comfort survivors. Assurance can comfort and protect you. Well, I went through that, not too much detail. And uh, I said, what God is trying to show us is he's not displeased because you're materially blessed. He wants to do that. What, dis- what he dislikes is covetousness, lusting after these things, affection for these things. If you give that up, then he can trust you with anything. Abraham was a rich man because he had a heart that did not covet these things. He said to Lot, you take the best, I'll take what's left. That proved he had in his heart no affection for the best. So God gave him the best. He said, Abraham, I won't say this to Lot, but to you, everywhere the sole of your foot uh, steps, he says, I'm going to give that to you. You see, because he could trust him with it. So I was teaching along this line that God gave us an Eldorado Cadillac. That's $9,500. Not a dime's worth of insurance on it. No affection. Now, I didn't say you had to come to that position overnight. We'll give you a whole week. There's a surgeon down in Georgia that he came to it overnight and he canceled all of his insurance. Malpractice, seven to $800 a year. He said, uh, I canceled all. I said, brother, I've never seen anybody put that kind of faith in God overnight. I've never seen anybody come to that position as quickly as you. Well, I said, brother Freeman, you don't even have to pray about it. It's in the Word. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. If it's in the Word, friends, you don't have to pray about it. You just have to believe it, act on it, claim it. So I said we didn't have any insurance on it. We had faith. Now, the reason I was saying that, this is a demonstration we had no affection for it. If you've got affection for it, you've got to guard it and protect it and insure it. You see what I'm getting at? Uh, that's all insurance is. that you're afraid you might lose something you've got and you don't have big enough faith for God to protect that or if He allows it to go to restore it. And I'll tell you, he's had to restore some things for us. And so I had faith and no insurance. I had assurance. And a man who hit me had no faith or insurance. (laughs) And there went the Cadillac. I mean, that was all of the Cadillac. God supplied another car for the Cadillac in the next town. He supplied it. The dealer said, I'll take your wreck and give you this new old 98 station wagon for you. You can't beat that. (laughs) That's where faith comes in. But we were saying, you know, we had no affection for it. And because we had no insurance, that was a demonstration of that we didn't care. And my wife turned to the pastor when I said we lost all that money out there on the highway. And she said to the pastor's wife in whose church I was speaking, she said, see, she said, who really cares? After all, it was only money. The pastor's wife said, honey, I know what you mean. We don't have any money either. <laughs> well, <laughs> poverty complex. I mean, right away she thought she meant we didn't have any money. We had plenty of money. I mean, I like you know, it's not all in the bank. We've got the gold and the silver and the cattle on a thousand hills. You know why? Because it belongs to him. And the scriptures say in two places, I'm a joint heir with him. Joint heirs own what he owns. Now, I'll tell you, friends. We're going to have to do some preaching to some of us to get us to believe that before you can come back into a place of walking in your inheritance. I mean, the scripture is filled with this. Not for the baby Christians or for the carnal Christians and all that kind of business, but for those who walk in the deeper life in the spirit and can give up affection for all of these things, then they can move in a realm of faith in finances where the kingdom of God isn't bound by their doubts and fears and lack of faith. The barn isn't going to be held up because of no money or we have to ask you for money. We're not going to ask you for a penny. It's just going to come. We've already claimed it. I'm just telling you now. It's already done. Praise God. Praise God. I mean, that's just all there is to it. Have we ever asked you for money? You've never heard this church ask you for any money. You never will. If you need chairs, the church buys them. If you need air condition, the church buys them. But you're the one that somebody's doing it. I don't know. We'll catch you one day as putting the money in there. <laughs> God's using you. You're the channel. You know, like I don't have it, but I've got the faith, so I've got it all. Amen. When you're a joint heir, friends, you don't have to go back down to the bank and look in the vault to see if it's there. God says it's all mine, and you're a joint heir with me. 
And we're getting things done because we believe this. We don't have a poverty complex. You need to be delivered of poverty spirits and poverty complexes. I mean, you who have them, not all of you have them. Well, let's get to the second thing that will characterize those who obey Hebrews 4, 1 and 2 and uh, who mix some faith with what they hear. So first of all, they'll be doers of the word, not just hearers. Secondly, they will be, unlike Thomas, they will be people who walk by faith and not by sight. Thomas said, seeing is believing. I'll not believe he's risen from the dead till I see. Jesus said, blessed are those who will walk by faith and not by sight. Blessed are those who, who will believe the report about me that I've risen from the dead and they don't have to see. Have you ever seen Jesus? You know, I mean, you could. some of you have had visions. I don't mean that, but... The night you were saved, the day you were saved, did uh, he appear to you like Thomas to convince you? Why, no. Well, he said, you're blessed. We'll walk. Those whom God will use in this end time, unlike Thomas, will be people who walk by faith and not by sight. That's Hebrews, or rather that's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. I'm telling you, friends, if we ever... If we're ever trying to say anything in this church, that's it. Because God can't use you. I don't care what your ministry is, what your place is, where you live, and all of that. Without faith, you cannot please God. Hebrews 11:6. That which is not of faith, even drinking a malt or eating pork, if it's not in faith. Romans 14:23 is sin. You've got to do everything you do in faith. Amen. Amen. You better not get up here and say you believe you're healed and you don't really believe it. You see, you just told a lie. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We must walk by faith and not by sight. God will use you to the extent that you'll close your eyes and walk by faith. I'll tell you, the less evidence you need to believe He's heard your prayer and answered it before you see it, before you feel it, if it's healing, before you have any sense evidence, the less sense evidence you need, the greater glory it is to God. He is most pleased when you just act on His Word because you heard it. You mix faith with it and act. He's most pleased when the Spirit inside says do something or don't do something and you respond by faith. You don't need any visible proofs to believe God. Now really, while that sounds hard to a lot of you out there, it's very, very simple because He's only asking you to do when He says walk by faith and not by sight what you're already doing. But do it in reference to Him and His Word. Day by day, dozens, scores of times, you're walking by faith and not by sight on the Word of man. There's a person in here foolish enough to go deliver his own letters. You put money in letters a lot of times. Put them in that box you can't get it back out. And you believe the word of the postal authorities, they'll deliver it. You're acting on the word of somebody else. That's all he said to do, act on my word. I mean, do you bury your money in a coffee can in the backyard because you can't believe the word of the bank that they'll give you the money back if you ask them? You know they will. But they don't let you in the vault. They give you nothing in writing. You just believe they will. You're acting on the word of someone else. Are you afraid to ride the bus because you can't believe what it says on the top, 4th and Broadway, that they'll deposit you somewhere and abandon you? No, you believe the word of the driver. He'll do it. Do you have to see Jesus to believe he's alive? How many of you believe he's alive? Well, you see, that's, that's one promise. John 3:16. he says, Now take all of my promises and raise your hand on them. Don't do it if you can't. But bless God, I can raise both of them. Hallelujah. But I believe it because he said it. Amen. And I don't care what contrary evidence there is, my friends, I'm just going to have to stand on the fact he said it. If I can understand what he said, I'm going to stand there. And I want to tell you, dear friends, I can't stand on what you think he said or what I think the commentary said. When I know what he said, that's what I'm talking about. But you're already exercising this kind of faith. Every day, everything you do, you believe the bridge will hold you up. You're taking somebody's word for it when you drive across it. And uh, so on and so forth. We could just go through this until it put you to sleep. But you're doing it already. So God is looking for people in this end time who will mix faith with what they hear when they hear it. Who don't need visible proofs. Who will take his word, believe it, <clears throat> and stand on it might do you good like some people do when they're preaching. I feel like doing it sometimes. Just stand on the Word to demonstrate what you mean. If that'll help you get what we're trying to say, stand on the Word sometimes. And just say, Lord, I believe every promise I'm standing on. Amen. Amen. 
God's looking for people to stand on. He is making up His list. Now you better listen carefully. Those of you who are privileged to come under anointed teaching, wherever you're getting it in this end time, He's making up a list and He's putting your name on this one or that one. These are the ones who are mixing faith with what they hear and He's going to use them tremendously. And in just, I mean, a short time. Like it could happen in six months or two months. Not like 20 years from now. Amen. He's got another list of those who believe just enough to get delivered out of Egypt from their slavery and get saved. He's like, He's making up a list of people who just stand on His Word. He's telling them sometimes audibly, I don't want you to go by what you feel or our circumstances. I want you to go by what I've said. A woman told me recently down in one of our meetings that she smoked for 30 years, cigarettes for 30 years, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, discovered the Holy Spirit didn't like cigarettes, and tried to quit. She said, I couldn't. I was bound with the habit. So that meant I needed deliverance. So she said, I went three times, three different meetings, deliverance ministers or other ministers, to pray for deliverance from cigarettes. She said, I couldn't get delivered. And she said, one day I was listening to Oral Roberts on the television. <clears throat> you know how at the end he often has prayer for those who want healing or deliverance and says to them, lay your hands on the radio or TV. And many get healed that way. You'd be surprised. So she said, I've been prayed for three times for deliverance from cigarettes. So she got down on my knees, laid her hand on the TV, and she said, the voice of God came booming out of heaven, not over the TV, and said, get up off your knees. You've tried that three times. It hasn't worked. He said, get up and stand on my word. And she said, that was all of it. I was set free just like that as soon as I got up and believed it. Praise God. Hallelujah. She said, then God gave her a vision. She saw all those packs of the kind of brown she smoked going over Niagara Falls. Just to show you. <laughs> Now listen, repetitious prayer for deliverance or for healing or meeting some need is not faith. He was telling her, but he's telling us. That's why he gives me these things through people and through my own experiences. He's telling us like he told her that repetitious prayer for anything he's promised is not faith. Faith is believing the word and standing on it regardless of what you feel or see. Overcoming the temptation when you want another cigarette. That's faith. That's believing you're delivered, and that is true deliverance. Prayer ten times for the same thing that God has promised means you've prayed nine times in unbelief. When you quit praying and believe is when you receive, when you stand on the Word. You see, God isn't interested in how, much, how many times you pray about His promises. In fact, He doesn't want you praying but once, and that's in faith, about His promises. Now, some of you new ones hear what I said about His promises, and then you save all this time to walk up here and say, but what about this or what about that? You know, and uh, about uh, we all, men ought to pray always and all that. Well, let's hear what we're saying about His promises. If you believe when you have received Mark eleven twenty four, then you shall have it. So you don't have to pray twice if you believe you have received when you pray. God isn't interested in the arithmetic of our prayers, how many times we pray. He isn't interested in the geometry, how long you pray. He isn't even interested in the music of your prayers, how sweet they are. He's only interested in the faith of your prayers, how much you believe when you pray. And don't let the devil do like he does so many people. Instead of hearing what we're saying and mixing faith in it tonight, have your mind going 90 miles an hour to some alleged proof text to try to disprove something that your church doesn't teach. You see, I get this everywhere I go, and I'll get it tonight if we're not very careful. Like I said, I preached on this same subject earlier this week, and a fellow came right after with an alleged proof text that had an if in it. When I said, never put an if on a promise of God. Don't pray ten times for the same promise. Pray once and believe. He said, what about this? You know, all he demonstrated was that he hadn't been mixing faith in what he heard. He's just like the Israelites. He'd been there for an hour and a half and hadn't mixed a bit, bit of faith in what he'd heard me preach. Because the proof text didn't mean what he thought it meant, and I showed him it didn't. Paul said uh, to the Corinthians, I will visit you if God wills. Well, I said, that has nothing to do with the promise of God. I, I tell, uh, we're talking about the promises. I say to the people practically every week, I'll see you next week, Lord willing. 
That's Scripture. I don't know if He wants me back there next week. He may move me off to China or somewhere. But I'm not praying about a promise. Well, he saw it right away, but uh, it didn't benefit him any because he hadn't been mixed with any faith. God deliver you. Pray that he'll deliver you from asking questions after a sermon. (laughs) Oh, some of you can't handle that. I can't help it because, dear friends, you don't have to go through what we have to go through week after week after week where people sit there and prove by the questions they haven't heard a word. Oh, yes, if you come, we'll deal with you in patience, but I'm exhorting you before you come. (laughs) We won't fuss at you if you come. We'll fuss at you before you come so that you won't come. (laughs) Oh, say, I I preached on confession, and you hear as you go out the door saying you're going to come back tomorrow night. I'll tell you already, I can't get back. I just don't feel so well. (laughs) You've been preaching on positive confession. You've been preached Mark eleven twenty four. You know, believe you have received when you pray. And so I say how God healed me of a certain thing. And uh, he's healed me of many things that have been manifested. One thing isn't yet. And they'll come after and say, don't you know God is healing that today? Let me pray for you. And I already said I was healed in 1966. You see, it proves they weren't even there. I was preaching all night on Mark eleven twenty four. When you pray, believe you have received. Then you shall have it. Don't go by symptoms or anything else. Walk it out by faith. And it'll be manifested. They'll come, and when they find out you confessed, you know you had something that wasn't manifested yet, all say, we see this healed all the time. Let's pray for him. Well, if I let you pray for him, I didn't believe I was healed back there when I got to you. By faith. Well, praise God. It's true anyway. Some people just refuse to mix faith with what they hear because it's not in line with what they heard. And if some of you here tonight would analyze what you're hearing in light of the Word of God, you'd find out what you heard wasn't in line with the Word, not what you're hearing. Now, it isn't professing infallibility. That's just telling you like it is. That a lot of things we've heard are not in line with the Word. That's why they sound different, you see. Because what we've heard, what we're hearing isn't in line with what we heard, but it's in line with the Word. And many, many people And this is the thing we keep stressing and we keep striving to try to get across to you. So many people think they're pleasing God when they just pray and pray and pray and pray about promises and needs they have. And do not realize this, it contradicts the very purpose and will of God that he teaches contrary to this. They think they're being pleasing to God when they say, if it be thy will, heal me. When he's got scores of promises, he says, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And to believe when you pray that you do receive. And uh, like the woman, uh, so many of us think we're pious, you know, when we we are in a state of unbelief. Who was dying and a friend came to pray for her, but she wasn't sure she would let her. And and she wasn't too sure she wanted her to, dying of some ailment. And she said, well, God can heal it if you want prayer. Well, she wasn't sure she wanted prayer. She wanted to do God's will. If he wanted to take her, that was all right. If he wanted to let her live, that was all right. And she said, well, would you rather live or die if you have the choice? Well, she said, whatever God wants. Well, she said, what if God gives you the choice? Which he does in the Word. You want to die of that sickness or get well? She said, what if God gives you the choice? She said, I'd hand it right back to him. I want to do God's will. You see, we have been taught the wrong thing so long we think that our unbelief is pleasing to God. And that's pure, raw, naked unbelief. When God gives you a promise to then pray, if it be thy will, about what he's already said. You see, God is displeased when we throw that responsibility back on him for receiving the answer. And he sent Christ to the cross to give you the answer. And to provide it. And then you throw it back on him like he's never provided it. And Christ never suffered and died to give it to you. He suffered agony to heal you. That's Isaiah 53, 3 and 4 and Matthew 8, 16 and 17. He died to carry away your diseases and your pains. He says he did. Hallelujah. And he promises this, and then we turn around, well, if it be God's will, heal this for that. And you see, this is calling into uh, a reproach upon the integrity of the Word of God. This is Thomas's problem. 
you see. He couldn't believe. He couldn't mix any faith in the report. And Isaiah said that, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then he goes right on and says the report is that Jesus will carry away our diseases, our pains, as well as our sins. He says, who's going to believe the report? Well, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> who's going to believe? Amen. Praise God, the Syrophoenician woman did. In Mark chapter 7, she did not have a single promise. You've got thousands of them. And yet she would not presume to go before God because of her great need and say, if it be thy will, deliver my daughter. Jesus said, it's not me to take the children's bread deliverance and give it unto dogs. She said, even the dogs eat the bread under the master's table. He said, for that saying, go your way, be it unto thee according to thy faith. Great is thy faith, your daughter is delivered. She didn't have a single promise. All the promises were to Israel before the cross. He said, none of this is to you Gentiles. I can't take the children's bread and give it to you. And she refused to take a no. She refused to say, if it be thy will, deliver my daughter. She said, give me the crumbs then if you'll give me nothing else. And he said, great is your faith. And you've got all of those promises, dear friends, and some of you out there tonight are sitting there and, and challenging this word in your spirit. And you've got the promises and still want to pray if it be thy will. And she didn't have a single one and wouldn't pray that way. Listen, God is no longer going to endure, tolerate such unbelief out of you or anyone else, including myself, when we claim to be children of God and won't believe the bare, plain, naked truth that He has set forth in His Word. He's making up His list. I hope you'll be on it. I hope you'll be on it. To mix some faith with what you hear. And let God set you free. Father, in Jesus' name, grant that there will not be a hearing of the ear and not the heart, but there will be a hearing of both, with both the heart and the ear, that we will receive what you've been trying to give us, this bread, this water of life. They will mix faith with what we've heard. And receive thy word. We thank you that you are faithful, being not a man that you can lie, but you'll fulfill every promise that you've made. Father, we just ask now that the Spirit will have his way in every heart. There will not be any barrier, hindrance, indifference, skepticism, resistance but only an open, fertile heart, good ground that can bring forth fruit. 160-34. In Jesus' name. Now, as your heads are bowed for a moment, as your heads are bowed, have you mixed any faith with what you heard, those of you who have needs? Have you mixed some faith for the baptism of the Holy Spirit or salvation in Jesus Christ? There have been people saved here today. He will save you. He will forgive you your sins and cleanse them with his precious blood. Mix some faith with what you've heard and come and receive Christ or receive the Holy Spirit. Don't come to talk or to tell about the problems. Just say, I'm mixing faith with what I've heard and I believe that when you pray... This goiter is healed. This blind eye is open. This headache goes. This back that I can't bend, I can bend and touch my toes. Hallelujah.
God for your mercy and your forgiveness. Hallelujah. Jesus, we bless you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you.